So hello, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to this virtual event hosted by Brookline Booksmith. My name is Alex Abraham. And I am a bookseller at Brookline Booksmith, which is normally located in Brookline, Massachusetts, but tonight is coming to you in your very own homes. Uh, if you're familiar with our store, welcome. Uh, we're, it's great to see you again. And if this is your first time uh, interacting with us in one of these events, or if, if you're not necessarily local to Massachusetts and you've never come into the store physically, it's also great to have you here. Uh, we're so excited to share um, these events with the community at large, all, all corners of the globe we've had people come in for these events for. So it's, it, it is really exciting. It's unfortunate that we can't all be together in person, but it has only broadened the audience that we're able to reach. So that's amazing. Uh, we are very appreciative of your support in being here tonight, not only of these lovely panelists, but of our independent bookstore as well. Uh, it's always great to support local businesses and local authors. So as I said earlier, uh, in, in case you missed it, the chat and question box are open. So please feel free to make use of those. Remember to set your chat to all panelists and attendees. That way everyone can see what you're saying. Um, and please drop your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom window so they're not lost in the chat. We're gonna have a Q&A at the end of the event. So don't feel like you have to rush and fill that out. You've got the whole, whole time to, to think of your questions, but we will be doing a Q&A at the end. Also, please note that Brookline Booksmith has a strict policy against abusive behavior and language, and at our discretion, any attendee can be removed from an event for partaking in such behavior. However, I know you're all very lovely people and would not dream of doing such a thing. Okay, so I have the pleasure this evening of introducing tonight's moderator, Dini Laliotis, who is an international trainer, consultant, and EMDR practitioner who specializes in teaching EMDR therapy as well as psychotherapy as well, sorry as well as a psychotherapy approach with a focus on developmental trauma and attachment. Currently, Dini is the founder and director of the Center for Excellence in EMDR therapy and that offers intensive training and a master's certificate certification program. <laughs> as director of training for EMDR Institute for many years, Dini worked closely with Francine Shapiro as EMDR evolved into a more comprehensive therapy. So Dini is very much qualified to be the moderator for this event. Uh, she was also awarded the Francine Shapiro Award for Outstanding Service and Clinical Excellence by the EMDR International Association in 2015, which is amazing. Uh, and she has authored and co-authored several articles and books and currently maintains a private clinical and uh, consultation practice in Washington, DC. So Dini, thank you so much for being here tonight and moderating this event. Um, we are also joined tonight by Michael Baldwin, who is an accomplished leader in the communications industry with more than 35 years of award-winning work in advertising. He is the founder, of, uh, founder and principal of the branding and communication firm, Michael Baldwin, Inc., and the author of Just Add Water, an incredibly easy guide for creating simple, powerful presentations. Michael lives in New York. Um, and of course, I like to use the phrase author of the hour uh, to describe the, whose work we're uh, sort of celebrating tonight. Oh, we are so excited to have Deborah L. Korn, who is a psychologist and clinical consultant living and practicing in Cambridge, Mass, an adjunct training faculty member at Bessel van der Kolk's Trauma Research Foundation and a senior faculty member at the EMDR Institute. She presents and consults internationally on the treatment of adult survivors of childhood abuse and neglect, serves on the editorial board of the Journal of EMDR Practice and Research, and is the author or co-author of numerous articles and chapters focused on EMDR therapy. So that's uh, all three of those lovely panelists you see on your screen right now. They are all very accomplished and have a lot of awesome um, titles and, and uh publications and just work. So that was, I'm glad I got that <laughs> all in there in just four minutes and we're going to have plenty of time for the event. So it's a pleasure to have them all with us tonight. Please join me in welcoming in your at-home applause, Dini Laliotis in conversation with Deborah Korn and Michael Baldwin. Thank you, Alex. First of all, I would just like to congratulate my dear friend and colleague, Debbie Korn, for an amazing book what you and Michael have put together is extraordinary and it's a gift both to our profession as well as to all the clients we've had and will have going forward into the future. And I just am just so honored to be here tonight. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you for being with us, Dean. So Debbie, EMDR psychotherapy 
it helps people deal with the impact and the legacy of trauma in their lives. Some forms of trauma, as you know, are quite obvious. Unexpectedly losing a family member to COVID, a mass shooting, a rape, abuse in childhood, the murder of George Floyd that took place exactly one year ago today. But in your book, you talk about trauma quite broadly and stress that EMDR therapy can be helpful even when someone doesn't self-identify as a trauma survivor. So I'd like to begin with Trauma 101, and then if that's okay with you, we'll move on to talk more about EMDR. So tell us, how do you define trauma in your book? Hmm. Well, in the book, we begin with the idea that trauma is part of life. Um, broadly defined, it, trauma is any experience that feels overwhelming, triggers strong negative emotions like shame or terror, and involves a sense of powerlessness or intense vulnerability. So sometimes we're talking about situations where something happened to you, and sometimes we're talking about situations where things that were supposed to happen didn't happen. So situations where you were not properly protected, listened to, cared for, or valued. We, I mean, we all know about um, big T shock traumas, right? The stuff that's on the front page of the newspaper every day, the, the kinds of experiences that you mentioned, Dini. Um, but the cumulative effects of small T traumas, what I like to refer to as quieter traumas, can be equally devastating. Um, so when we talk about small T traumas, criticism or betrayal experiences, um, involving humiliation or failure or neglect, microaggressions, as well as blatant discrimination. Um, if we think about in adulthood, uh, a divorce, losing a job, a difficult move, or the discovery of a partner's affair could be considered traumatic. In childhood, feeling ignored or different or unable to measure up can take an incredible psychological toll. Um, being, feeling, feeling powerless to have any control in the craziness or the chaos of your family. Um, and maybe the last thing I'll say about the concept of trauma is that trauma is not just the event. It's not exclusively the event. It's what happened, what was happening in your life before the event, the messages, the experiences in your life before the event. It's what happened during the event. It's what happened after the event. event. Did you get support? Did you, were you told to get over it? Um, different people respond differently. They have different temperaments, they have different histories. And so no one should ever have any judgment about whether something is a trauma or not because trauma is both subjective and objective. That's right. And in fact, you know, as you're talking, it's so clear that this is the kind of stuff our clients are coming in initiating therapy for. They're not coming in thinking I'm traumatized. They're coming in thinking I'm stressed out because my relationship ended, something happened in my life. So this broad definition of trauma is what we see in our offices every day. Absolutely. Right. So is there a difference between our brain processing a traumatic memory versus how we might process or make sense of ordinary daily life experiences or mm. challenges? Mm. Absolutely, most definitely. Um, we process experiences um, every day. We process normal everyday experiences moment to moment every day. So you go to a party, you see your friends, you make conversation, you eat good food, you come home that night and you reflect on the experience. You talk to your partner about the experience. Maybe you journal about it or dream about it that evening. But by the next day, you have you have processed through the experience and it goes up on a shelf. You're done with it, you move on from it. When you're dealing with traumatic experiences, something very different appears to happen. That traumatic experience gets frozen or locked in the nervous system. And it gets, it gets frozen with lots of different parts, right? With feelings, with the sensations that were experienced at the time, with the thoughts or the beliefs, the images, the sights, sounds, smells that gets frozen or locked in the nervous system. And the, the brain's information processing system is unable to digest the experience. 
and other information that we might have from other parts of our lives doesn't get integrated. It doesn't get integrated in. It doesn't get metabolized. It doesn't help us in making sense out of it because that experience is kind of locked over here away from everything else. I'll, I'll give you two examples. Um, I just saw a client a couple of weeks ago who um, told me that her childhood abuser had passed away 10 years earlier, but she said that she couldn't quite register that, her body couldn't quite register that. She was still living her life as if he were right outside her door, ready to attack again, ready to approach her. And she said, you know, one part of her brain clearly knows he's been gone for 10 years, he can't hurt her, she's safe, right? She can take care of herself. Yeah. But this other part of her brain is still in the past, right? The past is present and she can't quite shift out of that. Another client was just telling me last week about her parents' divorce at age five, um, where she somehow took in the idea that it was her fault, that her parents were splitting because she was too much. Yep. And she was, she was like a wonderful, sweet, charming little kid, good student. But somehow she got that message or got that idea and she's carried it with her her whole entire life. And now she's a mother, she has her own little kids and she can look at what happens for her that she carries this sense of being responsible and being a bad kid and she can talk some sense into herself, but in certain moments, she totally loses that ability to see that with clarity. Um, and that's why we need to get to those earlier experiences and get them processed and metabolized in a way that makes sense out of them. Because when a trigger comes along, boom, you're right back there in the past. You're feeling panicky, you're feeling frozen, powerless, you're ready to fight. You feel like you're 12 years old again. And then when that vulnerability, when that level of pain and distress is, um, you know, is continually being triggered, people do everything in their power to try to ward it off, to try to get away from it, to tolerate those feelings and those sensations that are there in their body. And so they turn to drinking or drugs or addictive behaviors. They numb out, they cut off. So we have to get to those unprocessed trauma memories for people to be able to heal in a comprehensive way. Yeah, no, that, that's exactly right. I mean, I, the way I talk with my clients about it is like our brain gets hijacked. Yes. And the past becomes present and we can't help but react yes. in those ways, even though we may know better. Of course. Right? So mm -hmm. that is the perfect segue to talk a little bit now about EMDR therapy, because that's what we do. We address how these memories inform our moment to moment life experiences. So talk to us about what EMDR therapy is and how does it work? Sure. Um, so EMDR is a memory focused psychotherapy. And, you know, in some ways you could say every psychotherapy is memory focused. You know, you're reflecting on your life, you're putting pieces together, you're making meaning. But in EMDR, we specifically search for the memories. We explore and specifically search for the memories that are somehow still awake, still alive and causing trouble in people's nervous systems, causing symptoms and causing distortions. Um, so it's a memory focused psychotherapy it was developed by Francine Shapiro, a psychologist in the late 1980s. Um, and basically it's based on this idea that psychological problems are due to the failure to adequately process traumatic experiences. So these unprocessed traumatic memories um, affect how we perceive things, they affect decisions that we make, they affect uh, our reactions to people and places and things. They cause a whole raft of symptoms, PTSD, anxiety, depression, obsessions, et cetera. And we don't want to keep cutting off the weeds at the top, right? Because what's going to happen? They're going to keep growing back. We have to get to the roots. We have to pull them out by the roots in order to really move forward. Um, so most folks don't come into therapy saying, I'm here to work on my memories from age three to age five. Right. Most people come in, as you said, Dini, um, they come in and they say, I'm miserable, I'm anxious, I'm depressed, I'm having trouble at work, my marriage is falling apart. 
And then it's the EMDR therapist's job to try to identify the most recent experience of those difficulties. We ask the client to think about the recent experience, to notice the feelings, the sensations, the thoughts that come up with that recent experience. And then we ask them to float back, to follow in their body, to follow their emotions back in time, to see if there's other experiences that pop up, that bubble up, that are that feel somehow related, that feel similar, right? Um, and once we identify a memory that feels charged and related to the symptoms in the present, we have ourselves the work that we're the work before us that we're going to do. We specifically work to activate that memory. I would ask a series of questions like what picture represents the worst part of that experience? Uh, what's the belief about yourself or the thoughts that come up with that? What do you feel and where do you feel the distress in your body? And I ask the client to focus on whatever's coming up. And then we introduce back and forth eye movements. I ask the client to track my fingers back and forth or to track a digital ball or a digital light that moves laterally back and forth. And we do sets of this, what we call bilateral stimulation. 30 to 60 seconds is a set. And then I check in, what do you get now? I should say that there are other forms of bilateral stimulation that people use. We, we EMDR started with eye movements, hence the name, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. But over the years, we found that other kinds of stimulation work, alternating tones, people wear headphones that go back and forth, tapping, I might, ha I might have a client put their hands on their lap and I tap their hands back and forth. Um, we also have something called the butterfly hug, which is self-tapping like this or like this. And for those of you that have seen Prince Harry yeah. talking about his experiences with EMDR on TV and at just about everywhere lately, he was using the butterfly hug. Um, the, the most critical point here with regard to moving into EMDR processing work is the maintenance of dual, what we call dual attention. And dual attention means we want to be sure that the client is firmly grounded in the present, in the current environment. I want my client to be connected to me, connected to where they are. And I want them just to be an observer, just noticing, being mindful of what's coming up. The goal is not to relive the trauma, but to witness the trauma, to be a passenger on the train. And no two people process in the same way. Some people may process with a lot of words, some people may process with big, big emotions. Other people might be much quieter as they move through what's coming up connected to their memory. Some people get a lot, there's a lot going on in their bodies and things shift in their bodies. Um, but clients remember what their experience was and other memories might come in as well related to that experience. They process fear and grief and anger. And as they report back to me, as I check in about what's coming up, I might ask, where do you feel that, right? What's it like to feel that? And I remind them that it's just a memory. And um, in the course of the processing, again, lots of things might happen. Somebody, a client might um, imagine saying or doing what they never got to previously say or do, raging at their perpetrator or being able to run away or fighting back with superhuman strength. Um, they might spontaneously see their younger self and offer compassion or care in their mind's eye. But eventually, by the end of a piece of work, the end of a session, the distress decreases, hopefully down to almost nothing, um, and relative, relative adaptive information um, comes into play, right? Information that they know, perspectives that they know from other parts of their brain get integrated. The goal, ultimately, is that we want the client to be able to think about the memory with no distress and to be in a place where they are able to um, in, in, uh, endorse, I guess, endorse positive beliefs, really integrate and feel and take in more positive beliefs about self, about the world. Um, and whatever feelings they still have about the experience, they're much more tolerable. They're much more manageable. There's not, we're not, they're not feeling distressed about it. And then ultimately, EMDR is a, a comprehensive psychotherapy. We're working on past, present, and future at all times, right? Past experiences, triggers in the present, 
and ultimately we're helping people to reach beyond their trauma and reach for the future, reach to be who they want to be, the best that they can possibly be. Right. So what you're describing is we're giving the clients neurobiology, the opportunity to do now what they couldn't do at the time, right. all the reasons, you know, whether overwhelmed, they were too young, whatever the reasons are, we're just not able to completely metabolize it, a traumatic experience when it happens. But then when we can move through it, then there's all this space to step into. And you wa we watch people grow and change long after these memories get processed, right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Then that's what's really exciting to see and to witness uh, as a therapist. Yeah. And so yeah. one of the things that people ask about when they ask us about EMDR is, well, what, what's the deal with the eye movements? What's the deal with the bilateral <laughs> stimulation, right? right? Like, that's kind of weird. <laughs> right. Right. Um, right. The very first time back in 1991, when I heard about EMDR from my graduate school mentor, I thought it sounded like the wackiest thing, right? It yeah. sounded like uh, really loosey-goosey. Yeah. But all these years later, 30 years right later, mm -hmm. there is a lot of research substantiating the positive effects of eye movements. Um, we now know that eye movements reduce negative emotions and imagery vividness, and they increase or facilitate the remembering of events. They facilitate the recognition of true information, meaning with the eye movements, people are able to discern what's important, what's relevant. They're able to have insight. Um, their thinking becomes more flexible, right? They, they are more open to associations and learning. And there's all kinds of positive neurophysiological changes that accompany eye movements. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk a little bit more about what exactly might be happening in the brain that lends itself to these kinds of treatment effects that mm. we see over and over and mm. over again. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, there's many hypotheses about what's happening in the brain. The brain is a pretty complicated thing. And I think we're gonna be learning a lot about EMDR and what's happening in the brain for, in the years to come. But um, there are a few hypotheses that have received considerable attention. I'll just mention a few of them. Um, one is that eye movements tax working memory. So working memory is the is the kind of memory that we use when we're trying to hold something in mind. So when we're trying to hold a phone number in mind or we're trying to keep a recipe in mind as we're cooking in the kitchen, that's working memory. And working memory has limited capacity. So when we challenge ourselves by focusing on something else while we're holding something in our mind, in our working memory, um, it, there are effects from that, right? Because of this limited capacity. There's a reduction in the vividness and the emotionality of the traumatic memories that we're trying to hold in mind. So that's the working memory hypothesis. The next is um, that eye movements appear to activate the parasympathetic nervous system. And what that means is that we see a de-arousal effect. We see a relaxation response in the body. And so we're helping the brain to shift into a more optimal mode, a more optimal zone so that the information processing machinery of the brain can kind of go to work. It can get back online, do the work it needs to do to help people resolve memories. And then finally, there's the idea that eye movements activate the same neurological processes that occur in REM sleep. Um, so we know from the world of sleep research that REM sleep is associated with reductions in negative emotion. Um, again, more flexibility in thinking, increased associations between memories and between different experiences and increased insight. And so that's exactly what we see in EMDR. Right. So we do, we see it all day long. <laughs> we, we do, if we're lucky on a good day. Yeah, for sure. But, you know, EMDR is much more than just eye movements, right? Yes, yes right. If it, was simply, if it was simply just about eye movements, then people could sit at a, a tennis match and watch the ball go back, or they could play pong, or they could sit in their car and watch their windshield wipers go back and forth. EMDR is an integrative 
therapy. It's a whole package, right? It's a comprehensive approach that's embedded in a warm, collaborative relationship. And um, uh, EMDR integrates many element, elements from other psychotherapies, you know, so uh, we see mindfulness, we see free association, people are working on distorted beliefs. These are all familiar from other psychotherapies and they're all part of this package. Um, and all of these elements work synergistically to help our clients heal. Um, though what I would say is that eye movements or bilateral stimulation may just be the special sauce. Absolutely. You know, and it, it's also, it's not just about symptom reduction. It's about total transformation. It's about the work is about helping people move from being a victim to feeling that they are indeed a survivor and then ultimately getting to thriving. So it's not just about knocking out those symptoms. That's right. It's not just the absence of symptoms, but it's about helping people grow and change. Yeah. Right. So mm -hmm. that, that makes me think about the whole range of clients that come to us for help, right? From the client who comes in having a, a serious car accident to a client who's had trouble all their lives with relationships, self-esteem, regulating their emotions. Talk to us about how do we how we help our clients prepare for EMDR therapy. Do they just yeah. jump right in or do do we take our time? You know, it all it all depends, Dini. Um, EMDR is a phase oriented approach. So we work in a very sequenced way and we move on as quickly as we can to get to that trauma processing because processing, that's where the transformation really happens. But if a client comes in and they have a lot of fears about therapy or they're really extremely dysregulated or their life is completely chaotic, um, we slow down and we help get things more stabilized. We help them bring in the coping skills that they need to just be able to tolerate the work of therapy. Um, we do education. We, you know, we work hard on the therapeutic relationship in terms of really establishing safety. We want to make sure that they can maintain that dual attention, staying grounded and not getting hijacked, as you mentioned, by their traumatic memories, by the tidal waves of feelings that can come when we actually turn our attention there. Um, so the, the earlier phase of work before we get to the processing may be brief for someone that has maybe a single episode they're coming in to address, or maybe much more extended if somebody has a significant history of chronic trauma, childhood trauma. That's right. So we, we can offer treatment for a broad range of clinical problems that people come in asking yes. for help with. Right? Yes, absolutely. So Deb, you and I have been doing EMDR therapy for almost 30 oh, yeah. years now. Um, I'm afraid to admit, but okay. <laughs> I'm a good company at least. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what do you want to say to our audience when they ask us why EMDR is our primary approach to working with our clients in therapy? Um, well, over those 30 years, I have trained in a lot of different trauma-informed models. And honestly, um, I have not found another model that I feel is as comprehensive or effective or efficient as EMDR. And, you know, it's not just my experience in my little office with my clients. There's extensive research that, dem that really demonstrates its effectiveness with post-traumatic stress disorder. It's considered an evidence-based treatment around the world. You know, it's in treatment guidelines and you know, the uh, WHO, World Health Organization, specifies that EMDR is a top tier treatment. Um, and when it's compared to other evidence-based treatments, it always does well. Um, I always like to mention that there's a recent meta-analysis that found that EMDR was not only effective, but also the most cost-effective of 11 trauma therapies evaluated for the treatment of PTSD. That's right. Um, and I love I love the fact that I, as you were just saying, that I can use EMDR with just about anyone that walks into my office. Right. Um, there's evidence mounting in the research literature that EMDR is effective with many disorders, many difficulties beyond 
trauma, you know, obviously trauma related disorders. So it, it's helpful with depression and bipolar disorder, anxiety. It's helpful with chronic pain. It's even helpful with psychosis, substance abuse, OCD. You know, my practice is primarily folks who have had significant childhood trauma, and I do not know where I would be without EMDR with, uh, with my, my patients. Um, and it's, it's just an incredible thing to be able to say confidently to someone when they walk through your front door, um, you know, you are going to be able to heal. You do yeah. not have to live with this. And it's not going to take a lifetime. Yeah, that's right. And I have just one more question because I want to make sure we have enough time for Michael. Mm -hmm. But just, we're just coming out of this pandemic. It's been over a year marked with political and racial strife. It strikes me that EMDR is a therapy for our time. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, that's a great question, Dini. Um, yeah, I would definitely agree. Um, we are in a mental health crisis right now, and it's probably only going to get worse. Depression, anxiety, PTSD are through the roof. There's just been so much loss, so much disruption of normal everyday life. People remain haunted by many things that they encountered this year. Um, and as I said, I can't imagine what I would have done without EMDR this year. Um, you know, I had the opportunity to work with some doctors and nurses and EMTs, you know, and they were able to process their anger about not having enough resources, their grief and despair and shame about um, possible decisions, the impossible, impossible decisions that they had to make and deaths that they couldn't prevent. Um, one of the docs that I work with was had been unable to return to work for a couple of weeks and in three EMDR sessions, he was back to work and actually felt renewed and felt hopeful. Um, maybe the last thing I'll say is that, you know, EMDR is incredibly versatile. It can be, it's being offered in groups. It can be done without words. It can be done using drawings and play. And so it's being used all over the world right now in um, post, uh, post-traumatic acute situations, you know, after natural or man-made disasters, in war zones, in refugee camps. So EMDR is definitely a therapy for our time. That's for sure. I yeah. second that emotion. Yeah. Yeah. So now, thank you so much for bringing us into this. I want to welcome Michael Baldwin, Debbie's co-author, to share his personal story with us and to talk with us about his experience in EMDR therapy with his therapist, Dr. Jeffrey Magnavita. Michael, welcome. Thank you. I have to tell you, I've already been receiving several messages telling me that I have to try to smile and relax. So I'll do my best to try to smile and relax during this next segment so I can bring down the whole show. All right, let's have some fun while we're at it, okay? Yeah. <laughs> so, Michael, tell us something about your story. I, I'm just so incredibly touched by your courage uh, to write about your experience before, during, and after your personal experience with EMDR th therapy. So tell us a little bit about your personal story. So the funny thing about my personal trauma story is that I didn't know that I had one. It's what I discovered when I was working with Dr. Magdavita. And as it, it actually very early on in the process, kind of the ground zero trauma story for me was neglect, which is developmental trauma, which I've learned. I've learned so much in the last two years with working with Debbie and then the time with Dr. Magdavita. Developmental trauma, when it has to do with neglect, can sometimes often be worse than childhood sexual abuse as far as trauma goes. Mm -hmm. Um, and one of the one of the unfortunate uh, parts of collateral damage with that is that you don't learn how to connect with other humans. Your attachment style, which is the terminology, gets kind of bankrupted, and you don't really know how to make that work. Yeah. So that neglect really was a maternal uh, centric thing. Um, and then on my father's side, I was dealing with um, a father who whose form of discipline was a bare bottom. Oh fraternity paddle um, that I got quite often. Um, and that was, in, in and of itself, I would say a, a sort of serial trauma thing that I had to deal with growing up. Um, and then for anyone who is understands what it's like to be bullied, I had a bully at home, which is my older brother. 
I also had a bully in school. And if you've been bullied as a kid, you understand you live basically in a state of terror because you never know when the person's going to strike. And it's a really, it's a very pervasive, unnerving way to live. Um, I also had sexual abuse and boundary issues growing up with my mother. Um, I was a very high energy kid, but I was also very disconnected and dissociated. So as a result, I was what was referred to at the time accident prone. So I was constantly falling and hitting my head and getting concussions. And, and my mother in her inimitable way would take large pieces of carpeting to my forehead as a child. So I'm walking around with the other children with this sort of Frankensteinian piece of carpeting on my forehead. So I kind of had a, all this sort of added up to kind of a short circuited brain. I couldn't read. I was already in a special school. Uh, uh, and after my regular school day, I would go to the Maycard reading school after my regular school day. And then on the weekends, I had a math tutor, I had a reading tutor, I got terrible grades. Um, I was also pretty much oblivious with, I think, as Dr. Magneto explained to me, when you have so much trauma in your head, which is why I think people thought I was ADHD, you can't really focus on anything in the outside world. So I knew nothing. I couldn't hear lyrics to, to music. I knew nothing about sports. I didn't know how government worked or elections happened. Um, I couldn't read. So it was kind of a crazy way to live and to grow up. But I would say, aside from that, I had a perfectly normal childhood. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a good survivor strategy for you. <laughs> so uh, can you tell us about the ways that you've struggled over the years? Yeah, I would say um, isolation was one major theme and just feeling alone, uh, feeling unsupported feeling unloved, uh, uh, feeling insecure. And I guess the, the bottom line deduction as a child, again, you know, a child's perspective, which was, was, I, was I was worthless. I mean, I, what deduction, what other deduction could I come to? So that's not a good belief to be carrying around with you as a child. So I, I started looking for an escape and some kind of survival strategy. So I started to develop this sort of fake false persona and my particular flavor, or you know, they say, what, what was your su substance of choice, your drug of choice? I became a status and achievement junkie and a workaholic, um, which is one of the um, trauma sort of symptoms that, are, that uh, society tends to kind of uh, put up with or approve. You know, workaholism is kind of a good thing. It's a good work ethic. I was definitely 24 seven, 365. Um, I couldn't really form any kind of authentic or deep relationships, even with friends. Um, intimate relationships were completely, you know, off the table. And then I had th three in particular nightmares that I never really understood that were, that lasted, they were serial, they wouldn't go away. And then I had phobias, but I didn't know that they were phobias. I just thought that they were just the way that I was. So as a kid, the idea of using a stall in a public restroom was completely out of the question, mm -hmm. totally panic, you know, inducing. I had no idea why heights were such a such a huge thing for me. And then when it came to any kind of intimate or even a suggestion of an intimate situation with a woman, that was that was just break the glass and pull the lever and you know, 911, panic, panic, panic. Um, but with the phobia thing, as I said before, I didn't realize it was a phobia. I didn't realize I was a trauma survivor. Um, I got very comfortable with, with alcohol and drinking, late night drinking, that I was in, in sort of combining that with Vicodin. And then at sort of low points, um, starting in college, actually, I would, I would black out. Wow. Wow. So it sounds like you never really connected the symptoms that you were struggling with as trauma from no. your childhood. No. Wow. So trauma was like not even on your emotional radar. No, it's because I never really related to the idea of trauma or thought of myself as a trauma victim. I mean, it, to my mind, and I think this is true for a lot of people, when you say trauma to someone, they think either a natural disaster, mm -hmm. combat, like you know Vietnam or, or World War II or something, or you've, or you've been held up at gunpoint. So that was my definition or understanding of what trauma was. So I never considered myself a trauma victim. Um, and I was, the weirdest thing was I was unaware of the fact that my pathology was in any way connected to anything having to do with what, with trauma. 
what I didn't know was I had two things. One, these, these nightmares, which again, three in particular, which were just repeated for decades. And then there were these fragments of memories that I, would ha that I had that it was almost kind of sort of absurd. I would share them with people. I remember sharing them with, with uh, my brother at one point early on. And when I found out later what they were connected to, I thought, why would I ever share that memory? But they were just little pieces of memories, and I, they, but they didn't add up to anything, and I couldn't figure out why they were always sticking with me. Wow. Um, and, you know, finally, um, you know, no therapist really, I mean, absolutely never talked to me about trauma or, or EMDR. Wow. So it sounds like you had been in therapy before starting with uh, Dr. Magnavita and EMDR therapy at what? age 61, I believe. Is that right? Yes. And I hope that doesn't sound like that's an old person that people <laughs> No. I have this debate with, with uh, someone who's watching about, are we getting, are we old or are we getting older? <laughs> uh, older. So yes, I was 61 years of age when I found my way to Dr. Magvita. Um, my parents would tell you from a very early age, I think my siblings would, would, would also tell you, once I decided or got fixated on something, I never let go. I never give up. And I think this is one of those cases because um, over 22 plus years, I saw six therapists. Um, some were talk therapists. I saw uh, CBT therapists. I saw intensive psychotherapy ther uh, therapists, a lot of them. And I want to be very uh, clear that, that there was some you know, intermittent and short-term relief but nothing was lasting yeah. and none of those in the aggregate put an end to the anxieties, to the phobias, to the feeling of isolation and also to the recurring nightmares. I mean, as recently as let's say, you know, four years ago, you know, in this apartment, I, I woke up in the, one of the, these, these recurring nightmares, and, you know, having fallen out of the bed, it was so terrifying. Wow. So they never left, you know, the, 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 the sort of scary quotient never got diminished in these, these nightmares. Yeah. So I just felt like I was treading water with talk therapy. And I was starting also to question the formula of this 50 minute once a week formula, because who says, and how is that supposed to be the, the, you know, the prescription for relief in my case, and part of the reason why I started to question it, because I go to these 50 minute sessions and I feel like I was in this sprint for the last five minutes you know, it's like trying to finish a meal when the waiter's, you know, trying to clear your plate. You're falling. I'm, I'm still eating here, but that time's up. Wow. So the past really was present for you for much of your adult life. Yeah. Wow. So what was the breaking point that led you to seek treatment yet again? So as a workaholic, <laughs> uh, my center of universe, uh, the center of my universe was work. Yeah. And I had, um, I had wanted to be work at an agency uh, called Ogilvy Mather forever in New York. And I finally got there and, you know, I spent seven years there. And then because of an account change, all of a sudden I wasn't there anymore. So yeah. it was like being, you know, untethered for the first time in the most profound way. And I, I just felt completely lost at sea. Um, my high paid, high status job was gone. Uh, <laughs> I sold my apartment. I it was, it was sort of insult upon injury. I not only just sold the apartment. I sold everything in the apartment with the apartment. Wow. So nothing. At one point, um, I had a visa balance of eighty-eight thousand um, dollars. I felt like I was helpless. I couldn't get anything in gear. The fears and anxiety just sort of got higher and higher. And there was one incident that was I would I look at in retrospect as kind of the nadir when my mother had come to New York and uh, she had been here for three days, I kind of went out of the way to, to pretty much do everything that she loved to do. And the day she was leaving, I realized as I was walking to her hotel, you know, she never asked me one question about me. Wow. She never asked me one question. And at breakfast, <sighs> this, was the, this was the mic drop moment. She said, well, you, you know, you haven't said a word about my new blouse. And that night, I went out, got completely, I completely blacked out. I came home with a gash in my forehead. You know, I was, I think I was scared that, that the doorman, you know, was coming down, bleeding from my, down my face and my shirt. And it turned into seven stitches in my forehead the next morning at the urgent care. Mm -hmm. And one of the last times I saw the talk therapist I was seeing at the time, she said, Mr. Baldwin, or Michael, I think she called me. I can't help but 
But notice that that's the same exact place where all the other concussions took place when you were a boy. Wow. Which I was really kind of eerie. Wow. And, so talk about the past being present. How about that? Yeah. That's, was, I think that probably was the low point. Yeah. So that was the tipping point that really opened the door for you to get into EMDR therapy, which changed your life, I think, right? So let's talk to us about your experience of the EMDR therapy. How did it change you? So as I said, I, I, I had gotten to be kind of a connoisseur. And also I want to mention for other people in the audience who might be just, just starting out with therapy. When I was in my 20s, um, I went to my first therapist because I, I couldn't concentrate. So as an adult, all this like crazy, can't read, don't know anything, can't hear music, can't hear lyrics. That was the excuse I gave him just why I was coming to get therapy. So EMDR therapy for me was totally new. It was unique. Uh, and, and I want to qualify this, what I'm about to say, saying this is just my impression. I'm not suggesting this is a universal understanding. But for me, talk therapy is like smelling a piece of pepperoni pizza. EMDR is like biting into the pizza, chewing the pizza, swallowing the pizza, digesting the pizza. Yeah. Um, and by, in other words, by way of saying that, that, you know, it was a way, EMDR was a way for me to really dig into the grief, the sadness, the anger, the loneliness, the fear that I realized I'd been carrying around since I was a boy. And releasing body memories, too. That was also a revelation in EMDR therapy. I didn't realize that you have things stored in your muscles and in your body. And it, those things also come out and through you. Um, so lately, because I'm always thinking about what's, how can I explain this in a way that people understand who, who haven't done it before. So here's my latest. It's like you have a dust mop. And the dust mop is, is filled with, with dirt and dust. So the, the dirt and dust is these buried traumatic images, feelings, sensations and beliefs. So it's really, really full. EMDR takes that mop and really shakes it really, really, really hard. And all the dust and dirt float away. They just float away. You're left with the mop. And the mop, that's the what happened, where did it happen, when did it happen, how did it happen. That all stays. But all the emotional charge just goes away. That's and you right. can feel it going away through your body, sort of like out of your head and just away. Right. So it doesn't change what actually happened, but it does no. change your experience of what happened and yes. how it informs your experience of self. Go right. On. And Debbie was talking about that earlier because, you know, yeah. your perspective when these things happen, you're two or three and your universe is tiny. So right. when, when these happens with, with Dr. Magnavita, you can attach an adult perspective like that wasn't my fault. They never should have left me there in the first place. You know, I, they, they had no business doing whatever they were doing. You know, so you get to you get to reattach a, a, an adult perspective to what's been here buried for so long with a child's perspective. Right. But that perspective isn't just here. It's also here. Yes. You know it in your body. Right? Yes, exactly. So talk to us about your book. There are a lot of books out there about trauma recovery and EMDR therapy too. So why do you think the world needed another one? Uh, well, I would say, um, for me at least, you know, if you can't read, you know, pictures have to kind of do the work for you. I'm totally a visual thinker. I'm totally a visual learner. I spent 35 years in advertising, a very visual me medium. Um, so what happened was, as I as I learned to understand these concepts in the two years I worked with Dr. Magnavita, I thought to myself, maybe I can capture these complex concepts with one image and some very little text. And 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 translated, that those images could be universal in any language for anybody. Um, because I wanted to create a, a way for people to understand these concepts immediately and hopefully unforgettably. I call them these, I call them billboards. I showed them to Dr. Magnavita and he said, you know, this could be a book. This could be a, this actually could be a book. And, and meanwhile, by the way, I, I looked and I couldn't find a really simple visual kind of handbook on trauma AMDR. You know, so I wanted to create something very simple easy to absorb, accessible, user-friendly, to decode trauma and EMDR for everybody, for nurses, for doctors, for teachers, probation officers, um, people thinking about therapy, people actually in therapy, but also for therapists. I mean, Dr. Magnavita, he's already bought 25 copies of the book because he, he's planning on you know, giving it to all his clients, but also his colleagues. Um, uh, me too, me too. 
So Absolutely. I want to add, I knew at the very beginning I could not do it alone. I had to have a co-author who was an expert in EMDR. So I'm, I'm forever grateful that Debbie agreed to do this with me. So Michael, we have just a few minutes for our Q&A. So as we get ready to transition to that portion of our program, is there a final message that you want to convey to our audience this evening? Two words, don't wait. I waited, I searched for over 20 years to find Dr. Magdavita to understand about trauma, understand about EMDR. I was 34 years old when trauma was, with, when EMDR was discovered by Francine Shapiro. And I was 61 when uh, I finally was able to engage. So one thing I told Dr. Magdavita often was like, I don't care if I'm late, it's later in life. But it's sort of like that scene in A Christmas Carol when Scrooge, you know, the three spirits have visited him, they've gone. He runs to the window, he throws open the windows. He says to the boy downstairs, what day is it? And he says, it's Christmas day. I told Dr. Magdalena, my fear was, I'll, I'll, I'll finish the MDR, I'll go to the window, I'll throw the, the shutters open. I'll say, what day is it? It's like August 8th. You know, I've totally missed Christmas. It's totally, my life is over. Yeah. So I, I like to think that, you know, that it, 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 it isn't the case. Actually, I'm, I'm finding quite quite the opposite, that Christmas is not over, so to speak. But my point is, you don't have to wait that long because there are qualified EMDR therapists all over the world now. That's right. So, so if you or a parent or a nephew or a child or a colleague or a neighbor or a spouse or an ex-spouse are suffering, you know, don't wait. Find, seek out an EMDR therapist. You can, you can easily find many probably in your zip code. Um, it can free you from your trauma, even if trauma, you aren't even aware that trauma might even be the root cause of what's right. a That's problem right. for you in your life. But more importantly, I think for a lot of other people, the other thing, one of the things maybe even more important, that it can remove obstacles that are in your way, obstacles that are standing in between you and the life that you deserve. So that would be my message. Don't right. wait. Wow. Thank you so much, Michael. That's a great note to transition on. on a smile. Turn it back <laughs> over to Alex for our Q&A segment of the program. Alex? Hi, yes, thank you all. Thank you so much, um, Debbie and Michael, for your for sharing your work and your book. Um, and Deanie, thank you for moderating. That was a really fun <laughs> uh, conversation. Like I've, I've, I can honestly say I've never um, hosted an event where the conversation was split so exactly between uh, co-authors. So it was it was very interesting to hear both of your perspectives on that. Um, all right, so moving into the Q&A, we've got a few questions, um, but actually right at the top, I just wanted to ask in case anybody missed it, and this question is from Alan, um, what does EMDR stand for? Uh, I'll grab that one. Um, so EMDR stands for eye movement, desensitization, and reprocessing. I know it's a mouthful and an earful. <laughs> and I think Francine Shapiro, you know, wished that maybe she had named it something different in the beginning, but that's what she named it. And the eye movement, of course, is about the, the tracking, the eye movement, the bilateral stimulation. Desensitization refers to the reduction of distress, the reduction of anxiety and fear, and reprocessing is what happens in the course of the work where you reevaluate, you restructure your thinking, you reflect and reorient, right? It's this process of really transforming your feelings and beliefs and body experience. So can I add to that? Because precisely because you say it to, to somebody, they'll, they'll never remember it in a hundred years. I wanted to, to, to name, give the book a title that right. the, a different set of words so they can remember the acronym. So every memory deserves respect. I've, I've actually watched people look at what they're looking oh. at. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. It's EMBR. Oh, I get it. Because it, it is a memory-based therapy. And so I wanted to give them um, uh, a way to, to, to remember EMBR. It's a great title. It is yeah. a great title. I think even as a sentiment outside of, of EMDR specifically, I think it's a great it's a great sentiment. So the fact that it pairs that nicely was was really good. I had that moment too where I was kind of like, oh, oh. yeah. <laughs> um, okay, I, I lost track of who asked this one, but someone had asked, and I thought this was very interesting as well. Um, how did having to go, did, 
did you have to go virtual in your practices? Um, and, and how did that affect your EMDR um, sort of approach um, in, the, in the COVID times? Well, you know, there's a lot to say about that. But the short answer is that we were all amazed how EMDR was able to make that leap to virtual. Um, you know, we all got little balls that go back and forth, little digital balls. We still use our fingers and clients track them. We have people doing butterfly hug tapping on their laps. Um, so we have done well, you know, other than having to shift to that kind of um, stimulation, we've done well. It's, you know, for all of us that have had to have relationships over screens this year, that's challenging, you know, creating safety, feeling connected, you know, connecting heart to heart with our clients has, has had its challenges, but I think we've all made that leap and, uh, and I'm really grateful that um, that we could transition to working virtually during this time. And to your point, Debbie, you were talking earlier in the program about how one of the things that happens is that EMDR restores a client's capacity for more flexibility. Right. And boy, we were all having to be more flexible, having to shift from working in three dimensions to two dimensions and really feeling into that connection and helping our clients feel safe enough they were willing to do it, they were able to do it, and we all got to the other side of it, I have to yeah, say. It was not easy for many people, but we did it. We did it. That's awesome to hear that too. I, I was I was thinking that myself as well while you were talking about it. I was like, I wonder what this looked like. Um, so that's great. Uh, Patsy wants to know, how is the book organized and how did you sort of decide on a structure for it? Um, what are you pointing to, Michael? You. You take it. Oh. Well, <laughs> every chapter begins with Michael sharing a little bit more of his story. We both introduce ourselves at the beginning, and then every chapter, Michael talks about a part of his experience. And then I go into the narrative, you know, the education about these symptoms Michael is having, or these struggles that Michael is having, or the fears that Michael had at the start of treatment. So we talk about, you know, what is trauma and what is EMDR a little bit at the beginning. And then we talk about the full range of symptoms and difficulties and compensations and efforts to cope that come with trauma. We talk about how trauma affects the mind, behavior, the body. We talk about how trauma affects the brain we introduce EMDR in depth, really walk people through what is involved in EMDR. We address the fears that people have about starting therapy, about you know doing emotionally focused work, doing memory focused work. Um, we um, and we ultimately you know talk about the kind of transformation that's possible. And Michael, Michael didn't get to talk about it much tonight, but you know, the transformation that Michael went through over the course of his two years of EMD, intensive EMDR over two years was quite profound. Um, so we talk about, you know, keeping your eye on the prize, what's possible. Um, and then we talk to people uh, in the most practical sense about um, how to find an EMDR therapist. What kinds of questions do you ask? You know, what to expect? You know, how can, what can you do to complement the work that you're doing in EMDR therapy? And then we give a whole bunch of resources in the back. Yeah, and, and I just have to say what I really love. It's so easy to understand. Your explanations are great. Mm -hmm. and, and Michael, you're bringing it all to life through your personal story and your experience. It, make, it brings it home to everyone, clients yeah. and therapists alike. I think yeah, it's a great resource. Right. I think Michael's story is all the way through. And then throughout the book, I also share examples um, from my practice. I you know, had permission from clients to share some of their stories as well. Awesome. Okay. So that does kind of bring us to the end of the hour. Unfortunately, oh. there are still a lot of really interesting questions. I was just scrolling through like, oh man, I want to know that too. Um, so the best uh, thing I can recommend to um, to all of you in the audience and myself to finish um, is to is to read the book. And I'm going to go ahead and drop the link there so you can get a copy if you haven't already. 
Um, I am, I will admit I have not finished it, but it is, um, the, the first few bits that I read were really, really compelling, just as compelling as this conversation that we've got to sit in on. Um, and I think it's a really, uh, uniquely structured book that you don't see a lot of in, uh, the psychology field in general. Um, I can say working at a bookstore where we have a lot of psychology books. So, uh, thank you all three of you so much for being here. Um, and I guess as a, as a final question, I would just like to know, um, if you would, if you want to go around and maybe each share sort of like one parting, uh, Michael kind of already did this, so maybe you don't have to, but this is sort of what Dini had asked you, like, what is, what is your best advice, um, to somebody who may be thinking of, of pursuing, uh, EMDR therapy? You know, what comes to mind is that if you're struggling in any way, don't feel like you have to figure it out before you step foot in therapy. Don't feel like you have to have a coherent explanation of what's going on with you to be able to walk through the door. You know, I always say to my clients, I'm sure some of my clients are on tonight and they know that I say, come as you are, right? Just come as you are, bring it all and together we'll help you get organized, we'll make sense out of it, we'll structure the work, we'll surround you with lots of love, and we'll scaffold in whatever way we need to to make it possible to start doing the work. And then the work will reveal <laughs> you know, where you're heading and, and the pieces will come together, right? Trauma, trauma fractures things, it fragments experience. And, and people can't make sense out of it. And what EMDR does and what good trauma-informed therapy does is it brings it all back together so you can make meaning out of it and you can be more peaceful about um, the course of your life. Yeah, I would second that and just say, you know, trauma is a part of life. And I think as Debbie said earlier, that approaching getting help and having hope that there can be healing available for you. It's here, it's out there, it's available to all who are willing to come and have the courage to approach. So thank you so much for yeah. taking the time to join us this evening. Michael, did you wanna say something? It's a kind of footnote to a question that came earlier because um, the, the relationship I have now with my brother, which I thought I would never, ever, ever, ever have. Yeah. It's not like it's Stockholm syndrome, it's just, actual real it's authentic we've never had this before and it's it's growing he has been working with a EMDR therapist that debbie recommended he's never been in in physical in her physical space never been uh, in a physical yeah. office it's only and exclusively been through zoom and his experience has been nothing less than transformative and he's become an unbelievable advocate for EMDR. That's amazing. That's a good real life example of it, of it working out. So, so all right. Yeah, I, go ahead. Sorry. I would just like to say thank you so, so much to Dini for being with us tonight, for guiding us through this process so we could share what we wanted to share with our audience. Um, it's just great to be with you. And Michael, it's been a wonderful journey with you. And there's a lot of exciting days ahead of us as we get to talk to people about the book and Alex. Thank you for guiding us through this as well this evening. Oh, of course. It was, it was a real pleasure. genuinely very interesting and I learned a lot and that's the best okay. you can ask for, I think, out of, out of an author event. So thank you all of you um, for being on this panel. Thank you everyone who came out tonight. We have um, like a, a very big turnout. So that was amazing. Um, I hope you all enjoyed it and I hope that you stay safe and well and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank, thank you. you.